So we're in the second week of a series called Hostage Negotiation. And last week I said, yes, that's a dramatic title because this is a dramatic story. It is one of the most dramatic stories in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus. And we were talking about recognizing that God is at work to bring us into full freedom. That was true for the Israelites in these days, and it is still true for us. And as we looked at that story, we said, wow, you know, how amazing of Moses that he actually noticed the supernatural, how God was trying to speak to him, and he he responded. He went over to look like, yay, Moses. But the conversation that we're going to get into today, we're going to follow this dialogue between the Lord and Moses, and you'll see that it's not all as easy as it might have (laughs) seemed. and that it doesn't always go smoothly because Moses is a real person, you know? It's easy for us to have this idea of Moses if you've heard anything about him or if you've been in the church for a while. It's easy for us to have this idea about Moses of this amazing leader with so much success, but this is how Moses started off. Now, the Lord had looked at him and said, I've seen my people, I've heard my people, I'm concerned about their suffering, and so I have come down, and I'm going to do something about it. And who wouldn't be excited about that news, right? Remembering that God sees you, hears you, and he's here to do something about it. But then we get to Exodus 3, verse 10, and the Lord says, So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. It's one thing to hear that God has good plans for us. It's another to hear that he wants us to be the one who helps get done, isn't it? And so this is where Moses begins a series. Five times he's going to question God about this plan that he has. Five times. And as Moses approaches God and the things that he said, I was thinking about high school yearbooks. I don't even know. Do they all still do this? But um, most likely to succeed. Aren't you so glad they didn't have a category like most unlikely to succeed? That'd be so cruel. But I think what we tend to do is put that label on ourselves. Like maybe in secret or out loud, we talk about how we aren't really equipped or able to do certain kinds of things. Right, things that seem too important or too daunting. And Moses approaches God here like most unlikely to succeed. And so as he goes to God in response, it says in Exodus 3, verse 11, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. So how did the Lord answer him when he asked, who am I? Did he tell him? This is why it's you. This is who you are. Instead, the Lord's answer is what? I will be with you. I will be with you. And so Moses, of all people, has reason to say, who am I to go do this kind of important work of negotiating the freedom of my people here in Egypt? Because his life's been a little complicated. We talked about it last week. So would people think he's an Egyptian? He was raised amongst the Egyptians in the house of the king. So is he royalty that he has position to go to Pharaoh this way? Or is he an Israelite? Because this is his lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if he's an Israelite, he's a slave. And can he really go to Pharaoh and represent people that way? And the other identity that Moses may have been picking up was that of a Midianite. Because, you know, he'd lived in Midian for 40 years. He'd raised a family there like a Midianite. So when Moses goes to God and says, who am I? He's thinking about these different sorts of labels and this external identity that he has. But God doesn't want to answer that question. Instead, God says, I will be with you. And this question of who am I is kind of an eternal question, one of these existential questions for all people for all times. Because Knowing who we are helps us understand the purpose that flows out of that identity. What's my purpose? It's tied to who I am. And the reality for him and for us today is we were created for relationship with God. We were created for relationship with God. And when we say yes to Jesus and through Christ have this restored 
full access to God in relationship with him, we realize that as children of God, we have these promises. God is with us. And so in this idea that we may feel like we can't face certain tasks, we're not up to the challenge, we're not really people who could do God's work, we're probably most unlikely to succeed. What God first wants Moses to know is that I will be with you. This is the source of approaching this kind of challenge. And this is our focus for today. The main idea is trust that God's presence overcomes your crisis. Trust that God's presence overcomes your crisis. So I have a lot of labels I can wear, and we, we like to know sort of how people look at us and how to define us. Go on anybody's social media account and look at their bio. How do we define ourselves? Usually with a lot of labels. But when I've encountered things that need the help and power of God, it doesn't matter that I'm a wife, it doesn't matter that I'm a mother, it doesn't matter that I'm a pastor, it does not matter that I'm a free Methodist. What matters is that I am a daughter of the King with access to all the power and promises of God by His Holy Spirit with me. And so this is how we face any sort of crisis, any sort of challenge that comes our way. And this promise, I will be with you, it was renewed when Moses eventually passed the baton to Joshua. The whole first chapter of Joshua is God saying, don't be afraid, you can have courage. It says in Joshua 1.5, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then as the Bible story goes on, as God's purposes and plans un unfold and he keeps inviting people in to serve him and be part of what he's doing, part of his mission, he repeats that promise over and over again to people. And we get into the New Testament where Jesus then looks at his disciples knowing that they're going to have to carry on the mission. And he looks at his disciples in John 14 and he says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Friends, God's presence can help us overcome any crisis. He has promised us in a relationship with him through Jesus that we have access to all that he is. Jesus has called us co-heirs with Christ, right? This is who we are in our identity. And so because of this, God is saying, you can step into this challenge, you can step into this crisis situation and know that you're going to be okay. So Moses says in 3.13, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Isn't this interesting? Moses, how am I going to tell them who you are? I don't really know who I am. Now how am I going to tell them who you are? How are they going to know? How is this all going to go? I'm switching mics. How is this all going to go? And what we see here is God is raising up Moses as a leader, most certainly. And I think today with the way we understand leadership, and I've done a lot of training and reading and been coached in all these leadership ideas and principles, and what we always want to tell people is leaders need to have a vision for leadership. Moses has no vision for how it's going to go. He has no idea. But God is calling him to take a step in faith, and this is the way we distinguish a leader for God's kingdom versus a worldly leader. It's someone who's dependent on the Lord, the presence of God, to move forward in the mission. So our first point for today, as we face challenges and crises in our life, is that God is gonna help us push through fear of the unknown. God will help us push through fear of the unknown. And that's what Moses is facing here at the beginning of the story. He has no idea. And so God says to him, when he asks him his name, God says in verse 14, I am who I am. 
This is what you were to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. So here's Moses asking his name, and it looks like God thought it would clear things up by saying, my name is the imperfect form of the verb to be. And this can actually be translated in a variety of ways, and some people get into all the different ways that you could try to understand this. But I'm so thankful that God keeps speaking to give it more context, because after he calls himself, I am, then he says, I'm the God of your fathers. Basically, the Lord is revealing himself here to Moses as the self-existent one, the eternal one, the unchanging one. This is who I am is, and he's already been known by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And friends, this is the God that is with us. The God that's self-existent, eternal, unchanging. He's been here. He was with us yesterday. He's here today, and he will be with us forever. This is the great I am that is offering his presence in the face of any of our crises. And so here's Moses getting this information from God, okay, so you're, they would know you, is basically what the Lord is saying to him. They'll know me. This is, this is the same God who has revealed himself since covenant with Abraham. And, and Moses is still not convinced. And this is where I came back to this quote from Bob Goff. Bob Goff's a speaker and an author, and he said, God invites us to be part of his plans, not approve them. Because Moses is still not really on board, and we're going to see that. And so God, in his grace, not only does he tell him, I'm with you, and I am the God that has been revealed and will be forever present, he goes on and gives him a glimpse of the future and some promises that are going to be important for Moses as he moves forward. It says in verse 16, Go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I've promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt. And then he goes on to say in verse 18, the elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. So he's giving him a promise here that they will listen to you. And then he tells them more about how this is going to unfold. In verse 19, the Lord says, I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards you. And it says in the Lord's own words, that they're going to leave with plunder. They're going to leave with valuable items as victors in this whole encounter. And so God gives him promises about what's to come, while at the same time telling him, you know what, this isn't going to be easy. Pharaoh's not just going to quickly say, sure, go ahead. Right? This is not going to be easy, but here is the promise, and in the end, you are the victors in this scenario. So he gives him a rundown of this, and what we always need to remember is God has done the same for us. God has done the very same thing for us. He's given us so many promises, including the I will be with you, to send us out on mission, and then he's given us a glimpse of what that's going to be like for us. So, First off, when Jesus met with his disciples at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, he told them to wait on this mountain. And I love how Matthew records the fact that it says some of them worshipped and some of them doubted. This is the reality of a life of faith, friends. There are times when we are just worshipping our hearts out, and there are times when we, like Moses, are just doubting. How is this going to go? And so we need to come back to trusting that God's presence will go with us. And that's exactly what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 28, 20. He gave them the great commission, and then he said, and surely I am with you always till the end of the age. 
These are the last words recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. It's a promise about their future. And then in the word of God, more grace for us is that God gives us a glimpse of the future. He gives us the end of the story in Revelation where we see that the end of the age will look like Jesus returning and restoring all things giving us a new heaven and a new earth where we don't need sun, moon, or stars anymore because Jesus himself is light in our presence. There's no more mourning, no more crying, no more sickness, no more death in this place. This is the promise. So when we face challenges, when we encounter crises, this reality of God's presence with us to the very end of the age and knowing what that outcome is, which same as for Moses and the Israelites, for us, we are victors. We receive the spoils of Jesus. So friends, today as we face these fears of the unknown, God helps us through. So then we get to Moses. Is he done yet? He's not done yet. Exodus 4. He says, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Have you ever asked that question? What if people don't think I'm really worth listening to? What if people don't think I'm qualified to do this? What if people mock me? What if I just completely lack credibility for this assignment? That's what I see Moses saying here. He's got to face feeling like he has a lack of credibility. He left a murderer, if you recall, and was a fugitive. And so this idea that people may not want to listen to you, people may not believe you. So how do we deal with that? The Lord is going to help him through facing this lack of credibility as well. And just the other night, I don't know how many of you um, know anything about the Dove Awards. Does anybody know what the Dove Awards are? Christian Music Awards. So Lauren Daigle won a whole lot of awards, one of the best-selling Christian albums ever. And I recently heard her say that one of the reasons why she can put herself out there, because, you know, sometimes she says the wrong thing, sometimes she does the wrong thing, sometimes she hits the wrong note. And one of the ways that she can face that is... She said, knowing who she is in Christ, and she shared that a friend told her this saying, true freedom is giving people their permission to misunderstand you. Are we really that confident in who we are and who God is that we give people the permission to misunderstand us? Because it's not about us. People don't need to believe in me. None of you need to believe in me. You need to believe in who God is. Right? And so this is what we want to demonstrate for people, not that they should have faith in us, but that they should have faith in a powerful God who's come to us through Jesus to set us free. So this lack of credibility that, that he had, the Lord is going to tell him how to deal with it. It's uh, 4 verse 2. Then the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. This is where I commend Moses for his faith because that is not the smart way to grab a snake. So he's already seen this sign happening, but he's involved in the doing of the sign. Then the Lord so Moses reached out, took hold of the snake. It turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, the skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. Now put it back into your cloak he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay attention to the first sign, they may believe the second. But if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground." 
So how is God going to deal with Moses' credibility crisis? He's actually offering to demonstrate his power through Moses. Do you know that God deals with our credibility crisis the same way? He offers to demonstrate his power through your life. He does it in small ways and he does it in large ways. And in here, in this story, Moses is giving us example of signs, powerful signs, what we can also call miracles, right? These things don't happen in the natural, they're supernatural. And so for us, when we live life connecting with this power of God that's supernatural in us, people don't need to look at us and believe in us. What they see is a powerful God. And this is what we are invited into by God. And as he's doing these things, these signs, one of the things that I am reminded is that God did signs in the Old Testament. There were signs and miracles, amazing things. Jesus, signs and miracles when he walked the earth. His disciples and his apostles did signs and miracles. And friends, we still believe in signs and miracles to demonstrate the power of God. The reason why these signs and miracles occur has never changed. It is always to validate the message. The miracle validates the message. And the same is true for us today. Do we have an expectancy that God will do amazing and mighty things through his people, the church? Because we can and we should. And so these signs that Moses is able to do are to point people to believe in the validity of the God of the Israelites, right? So Moses is not quite there yet. I think this is number four in objections to God's plan. It says in Exodus 4.10, Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord, I have never been eloquent neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And so how do I identify this part of what Moses is going through? Because I've been here. He has to push through feeling inadequate. The Lord's called him to a challenge and he feels inadequate. And so God looks at Moses then and says in verse 11, <clears throat> who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. And I want to press pause here for a minute. because this is a place where I think a lot of people can get hung up right here because it's a very natural question to say how can a God who is loving and patient get angry with Moses for being scared that seems like a logical question doesn't it but we get the whole of God's word and all of God's scripture to understand his character. And we also get the whole of this passage to see why that anger is and what that looks like. And so first thing we need to remember is all of this book, all of these scriptures are inspired by the Holy Spirit, written by human beings with the limitation of human language. You know this, God's thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. They're so much higher. So when we try to understand God burning with anger, it's not like when I burn with anger. Because we know from all the word of God that when we hold up God getting angry, it's always alongside a God who is perfect love. When we hold up God getting angry, it's always alongside a God whose character is filled, is entirely grace and mercy. And so when we think about that, even as parents, or if you've been a kid with some parents, you understand that when people want the best for you and they keep guiding you that way, but you keep resisting, it can be frustrating for them, right? And yet, in this case, we're not talking about a human being. We're talking about God, who is perfect in his character. And so his response in burning anger to Moses is more grace. Read along with me. Verse 14 said, Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother Aaron, the Levite? 
I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take the staff in your hand so you can perform the signs with it. So even though God was apparently getting a little frustrated after objection number five to what he is inviting Moses into, he offers him more support and more grace for this challenge that he's going to be facing. And it just reminds me, friends, that he's not asking you to be perfect. He is asking you to participate. He's not asking you to believe in yourself like a self-help book. He's asking you to believe in him, that the power of his presence will overcome whatever crisis you are facing. And so in this time, as Moses is responding to God with all of these doubts and all of these fears, and the Lord continues to lead him along and provide him what he needs to face the challenge, I'm reminded that these things are true for us. If you just look in that last passage, we can see God for us also, he'll use our story. He'll use the power of our testimony and make us a mouthpiece for him. He will absolutely use the people around you, your community, to support you as he sends you on mission. And he's going to use what's in your hand, even if it seems simple and common like a staff. But as I sat with that reality this week, one of the things that the Holy Spirit impressed on me was this simple truth. God will use you as a mouthpiece and the power of your testimony if you open your mouth. And God will use your community to support you if you open your life up to other people. How would anyone know where you struggle, where you're vulnerable, where the enemy attacks you if you don't open up and share it with people who the Lord sends to support you and build you up and speak truth over you? And then God will use the simple things that we bring, the simple things in our hands, if we don't keep our hands clenched so tight. We need to open our hands so that all of that is available to the powerful presence of God to be used, to face any challenge, any crisis, to be used as part of his mission. And so here Moses is being reassured by God himself, and we can be reassured by God, the Holy Spirit speaking over us, this truth that Holy Spirit will help us push through a fear of the unknown. Holy Spirit will help us face a lack of credibility, and it'll help us with feelings of in inadequacy. But we need to open ourselves and be seeking this powerful presence of God together. C.S. Lewis said, the great thing to remember is that though our feelings come and go, God's love for us does not. And Moses, you're going to see, I encourage you to read the next five chapters of Exodus this week. We're not going to go through every chapter in our message series. But what you'll find is Moses steps into this, as he does reluctantly, and things get much, much worse before they get better. And in not very long, he's back at God saying, I don't think you should have sent me to do this at all. It's not working. And yet, by the end of the book of Exodus, when God is again kind of frustrated, the people keep rebelling against him, and they want to go back to Egypt, and all these things have been happening, and so God says, I'm going to make sure you receive the promise. I'm going to send an angel of the Lord to be mighty and powerful with you and to go with you. And Moses, by this point in this relationship, after all that they've been through, Moses has learned that he is nothing without the presence of God. And he says in Exodus 33:15, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. Church, this is my heart's desire for me and for us, that we become so accustomed to the filling, powerful presence of God in our lives that we won't do anything without knowing we are experiencing his presence. And friends, to be in the presence of God requires a holiness that we receive actually through the power of God. So this morning, if you're in a place of realizing 
You've been facing challenges, crises, things coming at you at your own, on your own because you haven't given your life to Jesus, I encourage you today, say yes to Jesus. Say yes to Jesus. He, as our mediator, has lived this perfect life, paid the ransom for our sins on the cross, been raised again to glory, and invites you into that. Say yes today to Jesus. And as we have time to respond at the altar, the, the altar is open for any reason. Whatever is going on in your life, come forward and really engage the presence of God this morning. If you need prayer, some of us will be here to pray with you. If you want to be on your own, you can be on your own. But I encourage us as a church, this is my prayer that we are so dependent on the presence of God that all people see about those who are the body at Spring Arbor Free Methodist is the power of God displayed through us. Nothing in our own strength. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word. And God, we don't worship your Bible. We worship the Jesus that it reveals to us. And so, Jesus, we lift you up. We acknowledge that you've done everything for us to constantly be in your presence, this presence that helps us through every difficult circumstance and every aspect of the calling that you've given us. So, Lord, today I pray for our church. I pray that we would seek your face, that we would be so dependent on your presence that we would say, I don't want to go anywhere unless your presence is with me. So, Lord, today, I just ask that you would do a mighty work in this time. God, we don't want to be people who are educated about the Bible far beyond our obedience. We want to be obedient to you, Holy Spirit. We want to hear from you. So we love you today, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.